How's it going, everybody? Welcome to the Angle Fantasy Basketball Podcast. I am your host, Andrew. We do content for both Dynasty Basketball and Redraft Basketball. So if you want to check that out, head to our website, anglefantasybasketball.wordpress.com. Make sure to follow us on Twitter at anglefantasybb. This podcast is available on Spotify, Apple Music, and YouTube. We also do player videos and live vlogs on YouTube as well, too. So subscribe if you are new. Make sure to like or thumb it up um, and, you know, support us in our in our journey of growing our content and growing our uh, our platform as well. So today we are here to talk about more trades that have occurred in the Angle Dynasty League. So this is a 30 team real salary dynasty league. In our last episode, we covered five trades and we're gonna cover five more today because a lot has gone down since this league has first started. So this is gonna kind of culminate our off season trade reviews for this league. And then we will revisit some trades that happened in this league probably about a month or two into the season. So I am joined by one of my partners at Angle, also a member of this league. Mitchell, how are you doing today, buddy? Man, today is a great day. Not only do we get to talk about uh, our league and some of the trades, but I also got to meet Bobby Marks, uh, ESPN's own NBA analyst, Bobby Marks. He gave me a preview of who he thinks is going to win this year's NBA title and sneak peek it sneak peek he did say it'll be the New York Knicks with the acquisition of Carl Anthony Town. So it was nice talking to him and it really sparked up my day for this podcast. I know Mitch has that uh, has that golden opportunity to meet some big names because you work directly in LA Live right next to where they record, you know, live sessions of ESPN at least from the LA Broadcast Center too. So huge ad, huge advantage there. I think you've also met like Mark Cuban in that exact area, right? Correct. Mark Cuban, too. Didn't get a picture with Mark Cuban, but I learned my lesson and I took one with uh, Bobby Marks today. Exactly. I I would also assume Bobby Marks probably has a little bit more time on his hands than Mark Cuban as well. All right. Now, we are also joined by a very special guest. So a couple of episodes ago, I mentioned that we have a new song for both our intro and our outro. We picked this song because we hold it near and dear to our hearts because we know the person that made this song. We uh, participate in a lot of Dynasty Leagues with him. I know for me, he's in every single Dynasty League that I am in. Uh, So we are very excited to have him on to the episode today. Case, how are you today, dude? Hey, hey, what's going on, my boy, Andrew? You know, it's your boy Case from Case Core Podcast, West Saeed. Yeah, absolutely. And um, yeah, um, I give you a blessings to use the song and thanks for using the song as well you know we're family so um keep it going i support the content absolutely case's song is known as batman you can find it on pretty much any uh music listening platform that's out there so case is an og in regards to podcasts that are league specific one of the first deep league dynasty leagues that mitch and i joined it is in a private server we are still in that league to this day uh, Case was running a podcast covering some things that were happening in that league. So we knew when we put this league together uh, that we absolutely wanted to do regular coverage of podcasts for that league, um, power rankings, all, so, all different types of good stuff to make it as special as possible for the members of that league. So, so Case, how does it feel to be back in the booth for, for podcasting? Man, I mean, uh, you know, at first I was a little nervous because I haven't really done anything like this in probably over a year or so. So, um, but yeah, I, I feel right at home and I definitely appreciate you for having me. Awesome, awesome. Things are sounding good. You got a great microphone. So today's going to be a good episode. So um, as we stated in the previous episode, we have a new theme, which is known as the blockbuster. So for the two or I guess two or more teams that are involved in the most high profile trade that has occurred since the last episode, uh, we will feature that most heavily in the current episode. In addition to that, they are featured on the thumbnail in the title, um, and we go into the deepest analysis on this trade as well too. One thing I wanted to talk about as well is we got a Jersey theme for today's episode. I recently picked up Victor Wembanyama's French Olympics jersey. This is actually basically half off on Fanatics right now. A full-on uh, Jumpman official Wemby France jersey. Mitch, what are you sporting today? I'm rocking the Jaime Hawkes white jersey. All right. Very good. Case, what about you, my friend? Hey, that's fresh. When you told me you was going to wear the Wemby, I thought about the Tim Duncan, but that's too many Spurs, man. You know I'm a Rocket fan, so I'm over here at East All-Stars. Tracy McGrady, I don't know if you can see the bag, but you know, Ooh. I, I, I had a rep for the Rockets, you feel me? <laughs> One of my absolute favorite players of all time. I got that. I got like a special edition Fungo Pop back there of T-Mac with the, it's got his Slam magazine cover on it on there too. 
Very, very big T-Mac fan here. Yes, All right, sir. so let's get into our first blockbuster trade for today. So here we are with our first featured blockbuster trade. So glad we were able to show off our sweet jerseys before we minimized our beautiful faces up into the corner here. But one thing you will notice, and I'm going to give a huge shout out to Mitch for helping me out with this, is that the visual presentation of our uh, trades that have taken place is definitely a lot more improved. We have player names and salaries included um, and have just really cleaned this up a bit. So of course, we strive to make improvements in our podcast with every step. So from our last episode to this one, I think you're going to pr see a pretty big jump in quality of the way our trades are displayed here. So let's take us into this first blockbuster. Our two involved teams here is first off going to be the Brisbane Bullets. This is his second consecutive blockbuster involvement for our trade review episode. Shout out to NZ Bulls. He was in a trade with the Hobart Chargers. So this is for, um, involving our friend Ben. So this is involving two, um, I think... I'm not sure if NZ still lives in Australia or not, uh, but, you know, two friends coming from that general area that are a part of our league since we are a international-based dynasty league. So the Brisbane Bullets, he sent Evan Mobley and Zeke Naji over to the Hobart Chargers who sent Zion Williamson, a 2025 first-round pick, and two 2025 second round picks to Brisbane in exchange for Evan Mobley and Zeke Naji. So Case, you are the guest of honor today. We're going to have you go first. How do you feel about this trade for both Brisbane and Hobart? Uh, I, I'll start off by saying, um, you know, I, I see trades from three dimensions. There's age, contract, and production, and you definitely have to balance those three elements. Um, you know, to com come up with a total value. I, I think the easiest way that I do is I look at the most recent, I'll say, dynasty salary draft and kind of see where players went to kind of get a gauge of where their value might be in total with those three. So with this being said, um, um, my answer, I would say I would go Zion in a first. Uh, first off, I would say the biggest mistake in dynasty basketball, I say dynasty across the board, but since we're focusing on basketball, is selling your first post the inaugural draft. Like, I know everybody has a sense they're building their team, they're feeling good about their team, and they think they're going to be like a top five team or so. But I guarantee you, if you message 20 to 25 teams post-inaugural drafts, they're probably having the same mindset. So if 25 teams think they're going to make the playoffs, I'll say about nine of those are probably going to be lottery picks. And it, it most likely, it might be yours, I would say. So um, I, I think um, that's the one biggest mistake is people overestimate how good their team is going to be. So just right off the back, if you're getting a first round pick attached to two players that are close enough in value, I'm going to roll with the side that's getting the first round pick. So with that being said, um, I, I know Mobley over here has 11.2 mil on his salary right now, but that was when the draft was going on. Um, Since then, the extension has happened. And I think that that plays a big part in what his value is going to be going forward. So uh, I know in our inaugural draft, he went in the first round, but I think if, if everyone saw that extension, he probably would have went a little bit later, mid-second, closer to where, to where Zion went. So I think you're getting a first-round pick oh, almost free. You're not completely free, but uh, yeah, that's why I'll roll with the Zion and um, the first. Yeah, because I mean, at least for this deal, we, you know, I'm not, at least in, in my perspective, I'm not paying too much attention to Zeke Naji. The second round picks are okay. They're mostly as trade bait. But what we're really looking at here, and it's kind of what's featured on the thumbnail, is Zion plus this is this is the first that belongs to Hobart Chargers. So now he no longer retains control of his first round pick. So Zion plus his own first round pick in order to bring in Evan Mobley. So yes, he does get the discount on Mobley for this year. But moving forward, uh, Mobley is going to cost probably around what Zion costs right now. And my major hesitancy with this is I am starting to get fully sold and becoming a believer on skinny in shape zion he looks incredible physically i mean we haven't obviously seen you know videos of him doing crazy dunks or anything like that but we really don't need to the fact that he looks so much different physically wise is a is such a huge uh such a huge like uplifting factor for the belief in zion as a dynasty prospect i mean you know this time in uh, what was Zion's draft, 2019 or 2020? You know, I'm sure he was valued way insanely higher at, the, at you know at, than than where he's being valued at right now. And this was a guy who had the potential and the hype to completely change the landscape of the NBA when he was drafted, just due to the unique type of physical prospect that he was. So I think a big part of Zion's health concerns was his weight. 
just his overall mass, especially throughout his first couple of seasons in the NBA where he was getting pretty close to 300 pounds. I don't think they were very honest about his weight. I think he was like maybe even comfortably above 300 pounds. And now he might be ranging closer to like a little bit more like what LeBron weighs, like maybe 260, 250, two, you know, somewhere between 250 and 270. And 40 pounds is a lot of weight. Think about the difference in, you know, in like, the, the, for, for example, in combat, in combat sports, there's weight classes for a reason. So with Zion losing that much weight, I'm really excited to see what kind of extra mobility he gains in addition to being possibly more durable moving forward too. And in the right punt, Zion's extremely valuable for a nine category build. I know Mobley, I, I myself hyped up Mobley a ton, um, when, especially when he was first drafted, at least dynasty rank wise, probably like when we first did our very first dynasty ranks last year, he was either in or very close to the top 10 in my end. But I started to sour on that just because he didn't show the development that we wanted. There is those potential talks of being this generation's like Chris Bosch or Pau Gasol. But in order to do that, you need a very large offensive output and just arsenal of moves that you have in your bag. And it really doesn't seem like Mobley has that. If anything, I would say somebody like Chet Holmgren has a better bag than he does. So what about you, Mitch? How do you feel about this trade? Yeah, I, I at least want to come to Ben's defense in some regard. I like how you mentioned uh, how Mobley was around a, like a top 10, top 15 asset not too long ago. Uh, you know, I w it was a really great point. And at that same point, Zion was around, you know, hovering around that top 50 area. Um, last year was really Zion's lone healthy year, which really raised his value and bridged the gap. Um, but in the playoffs, after Donovan Mitchell went down, you know, Mobley did show some new offensive flashes as a creator in the playoffs where he really erupted, not erupted, but he broke out of that like 15, 16 point mold, point per game mold to more of a 20 to 25 point per game scorer. And that really excited a lot of dynasty managers talking to, you know, Slice who drafted him. He really was encouraged by that playoff output. Um, Yes, they extended Donovan Mitchell in the offseason. So, you know, the hopes of that uh, transitioning and playing through are kind of gone. But it gives you some a little bit of belief that we can still see that potential that we really, really uh, wanted in Evan Mobley. Um, with his contract, I do, to Case's point, agree that, you know, that production for the value at 44 mil uh, within the next five years isn't the most ideal for someone who really caps at a top 30 uh, category league rank. Um, but Zion really has that first round upside if he ever gets those stocks back. Um, upside play, I would take Zion. And along with the first, could potentially be a lottery pick. You know, so you do get the you do get the highest uh, upside play with Zion, but also the lottery pick. But if you want um, a more stable type of defensive engine you know what you're getting uh then i i can see where hober is going with this trade but i don't think it's entirely uh leaning one way over the other um but to hobert's defense evan mobley can still hit that potential 100 percent agreed we can't you know give up on mobley yet there is a lot of potential still there because he was a very special part of a, of that coveted 2021 draft class which you know, has produced basically 10 regular rotation or starter level or better players out of that draft so far with some other guys who are chipping in in rotations here and there. But, you know, for a draft class to feature pretty much almost 10 like regular starters is an extremely special and very, very, very unique type of draft class. So Mowgli was definitely a part of that. And he was up towards the top of that draft class along with like Kate Cunningham and Jalen Green. Um, so the potential is still there. I don't think he was coveted as highly as Zion was at the time. But of course, we're all aware of Zion's health issues. And, you know, it, uh, to, to, to kind of help or add to what Mitch was doing, you know, if we're going to be in Hobart's defense a little bit here too, he might just be tired of dealing with the what if Zion gets hurt? What if, what if this, what if that, you know, being a little bit too worried about where he's at from a physical standpoint. So I do agree that Mobley is safer right now. I just think that 
with Zion's upside, in addition to, you know, this is the second consecutive episode in a row where the Brisbane Bullets is a uh, featured in one of our blockbuster trades. So giving him a first round pick in addition to two other second round picks mean we're probably going to see another trade in a future episode where he's getting some other type of star moving more picks. Picks are very often looked at as trade ammunition by a lot of different managers, especially ones that, you know, are actively competing to win money as opposed to rebuilding for the future. Um, so, yeah, given some, you know, for, from his team name, we're giving Brisbane some more bullets to work with here. Yeah, Andrew, yeah. before, oh, sorry. Uh, I just want to add one point just to give some team context on Hobart. Um, moving Zion, it could potentially be a strategy to have someone a little bit more stable uh, given the context of his team. He has someone, his cornerstone, his first round draft pick, Jalen Johnson, who has historically been pretty injury prone over you know the first three years of his career rudy gobert he's very prone to in ankle injuries back injuries mark williams who he traded for and you know pretty recently that we're going to be covering uh with hobart so there is some sense of stability that mobley provides to hobart and maybe that's kind of why he made this move so i can kind of see it in another light as well sorry case <laughs> No, no, that's okay. That's okay. I, I just wanted to touch on that aim, the ammo point, as far as like what first round picks could be, and I, I would say, um, yeah, it, it, they're those first round picks are ammo, but you definitely, I think it's just smarter to use them mid season. So I, I know some. I looked at Hobart's um team, and um, it looked like he 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 he's traded his first to help his contention, right? So it, it, maybe he wasn't as comfortable as far as if he didn't sell his first, how well he would contend. I think if you're in that position, you just ride it out and see how the season goes. And then if you're somewhere in the playoffs, then you sell your first and for an upgrade. Outside of that, if if you see it's too competitive, you could just fall back. You know, you just need that flexibility going to, going into the season. So, um, yeah, that that's I just want to make that point as far as when inaugural drafts um go after the inaugural draft, instead of trading your first immediately or just every season, instead of trading it immediately unless you're like a top tier team where it's like all right there's no way i'm missing the playoffs like i would definitely save that ammo to like later in the season trade deadlines when teams might be transferring to saying okay i'm not competing anymore let me let me rebuild now you have that first round pick to give to them so one thing that a lot of managers don't do which most dynasty leagues do allow is protecting your first round pick uh, at least our league and a lot of other different leagues out there will allow you to do this where you can protect your pick, you know, let's say lottery, top 14 protected, uh, top eight protected, top four protected. So that let's say the season doesn't go well for Hobart and he protected his pick and then he land his team lands in the lottery. He would get his pick back and then would convey his 2026 pick unprotected to the Brisbane Bullets instead. For, for you out there in a dynasty league moving forward, if you ever are in a situation where you are trading your own first round pick, make sure to check and ask to see if there is protections available in your league. Most leagues will allow it. Um, and it's something that you should absolutely, you know, a lot of people don't take enough advantage of being able to protect your first round pick. It happens in the NBA all the time and it needs to happen more in dynasty. All right, so let's take us to our second trade here so this is involving two teams that have not been featured in our uh trade episodes covering the dynasty league yet so the first team is colossus roads that's from our that's our friend colby from canada shout out to him and the next team is the south bay lakers i believe that is your friend javier correct mitch correct javier shout out all right very good very good so Colossus Rhodes sent out Keldon Johnson and Cam Reddish, and in, in, in return, the South Bay Lakers sent him Clint Capella. So from my own perspective in this league, I can tell you that after the startup draft, basically the only like solidified rotation center that I grabbed was Derek Lively. And what I really was trying to do for weeks after that draft was acquire another center who's at least you know gets a good amount of minutes in his, in his rotation and originally i had jalen williams you know, j will not j dub from okc they okc just brought in isaiah hartenstein so that was a really big uh i guess just decline to my overall outlook for jalen williams for okc getting any types of minutes and being any type of a useful backup center to me so in my time trying to acquire another center I had a very, very tough time. It wasn't until I made a larger scale trade that I ended up getting a Steven Adams to be my backup center. But I could just say from this standpoint, 
with Colby here, I'm very impressed that he, I don't really see this as spending too much to land a solid everyday center such as Clint Capella. So this is a conversation that's been going on for a long time. And Case, I'm of course going to have you chime in on this too. We're all still waiting for the Capella decline. It for especially in Dynasty for a long time, we've all been talking. It's gonna be Anyaka Kongwu eventually. He's gonna cut he's gonna take over. Hawks will either fade out Capella and or trade him, and it's gonna be a Kongwu's role to have. But that has yet to happen. It's either Clint Capella featuring prominently in the role or Capella and a Kongwu splitting their minutes. And Capella's just too useful from a real life basketball standpoint to be on the bench. He's a very, very good screener, an excellent pick and roll partner and a great rim runner. He is always good for, you know, basically a double, double per night. And this is something that he's been keeping up for a long time. In addition to that, Capella's pretty durable too. So with the moves that the Spurs have made, people are starting to suspect that perhaps Keldon Johnson could be phased out at some point. You know, for myself in, in this situation too, Cam Reddish, I'm a Lakers fan. I mean, I don't, you know, I just look at Cam Reddish as a depth piece. I've been mostly uh, hoping for, and especially now that JJ Reddick is there, really hoping that prominent wing minutes are going to go to Max Christie. So thank the sweet Lord, Toreen Prince is gone. So, you know, if, if Reddish is going to play some depth minutes, that's cool. I just don't think he's going to be in that, you know, Toreen Prince role. I think that's basically going to be shared by Dalton Connect and Max Christie. So really look at it from this standpoint of Keldon plus just a little bit extra for Clint Capella. But keeping in mind what I said, it's really hard to land a center in this league as at this moment in time. That might change as the season goes on. Uh, but I like this a lot for Colby just because of how hard it is to land a, a good center. Mitch, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I'm looking at Colby's team right now. And, you know, besides Jakob Pertl, he didn't really have anybody before Clint Capella. I know he has Porzingis. There's a lot of injury concerns with Porzingis year in and year out, uh, especially now that he just had surgery where he's probably going to be returning sometime in late December, early January, which is about half of the season. So if you're only running... Uh, Jakob Pertl, who is pretty injury prone himself, you're really, you know, not helping yourself in any way as a contending team, especially when you have only one center uh, playing at any given time, and they're not going to play every day given how NBA schedules work. Um, with that being said, Javier, Laker fan, as you may know, South Bay, so maybe he does have something in his heart for Cam Reddish. You know, the Lakers do need uh, defense. Um, Cam Reddish is someone who provides that. He doesn't really help with the three-point shooting. He's one of the worst and inconsistent three-point shooters that we've seen throughout the duration of his career. And Keldon Johnson, to your point, Andrew, has been really been phased out, not to the point um, as a Malachi Branham, um, but Keldon Johnson is pretty much considered a veteran for the San Antonio Spurs playing for the Olympics. He's one of Pop's most tenured Spurs. Um, and, you know, with Devin Vassell uh, really emerging, you know, we we really see that decline. And for uh, Clint Capella, I don't know if we're ever going to really see that decline anytime soon. He just turned 30. And with the age of NBA medicine, you know, these players are serviceable until their mid 30s now. Um, and he has a lot of great intangibles that you want in a center, great mobility. He is someone who can is pretty underrated switchability wise in the pick and roll. I always go to the point when the Houston Rockets played against the Golden State Warriors in those KD years. I was always, always, always impressed on how Clint Capella could handle Steph Curry out in the perimeter in spurts on an island. Um, so Clint Capella always has some sort of admiration in my heart. Um, so yeah, I would lean more on uh, the closest side of things in this trade. But I also want to hear um, Case's um, perspective on this. You know, you follow Clint Capella's career throughout. Do we share the same points as, you know, me and Andrew in terms of his, uh, not only his value and in, in person or in real life, but also in fantasy? I mean, what do you think of this trade? I mean, yeah, I've, uh, yeah. Clint Capella is close to my heart being a Rocket fan. Absolutely. But um. You know, all good things come to an end eventually, right? So, like, I know everybody's been waiting for Onyeko Kongwu to take over Clint Capella. But, I mean, in reality, if you look at the Hawks roster, they're they're just 
they've always been a little too good to just move on from Clint Capella. And I don't know how comfortable they are with um, starting Onyeko Kongwe as their starting center. Because like, if you look at their roster, even going into this season, they just got the number one pick. I mean, they, they have Trey Young, Banyanovic, Jalen Johnson, Clint Capella, and then they have the number one overall pick to throw into that starting lineup. And then when you look at their bench, they got – um, Onyeko Okongwu, Larry Nance, who who I think has a little more juice as a backup, and DeAndre Hunter. We hate him as a starter, but off the bench, like he's a six man candidate, honestly, off the bench. So, um, and then their backcourt off the bench, you have you see Kobe Buffkins, Dyson Daniels. Like, I mean, I mean, th th this team is I think is a little better than people are giving it credit for, and I don't think they're just gonna move on from Clint Capella um as easily because I don't know, I don't think they're comfortable with just starting OO there at center but um i mean eventually they're gonna have to buy into him so um with that being said with this trade uh I, i'm i'm rolling with keldon johnson because like, like i Ooh. said like like i said i'm i'm I, I do hold clint capella close to heart and like i said um all things come to an end eventually i i just think eventually clint capella his cliff is pretty close we don't know when it's going to be but i just don't want to be holding the bag when that cliff hits because it hits the centers pretty hard so um and then just the evolution of the center is just bound to catch up to him because, you know, you, like you said, the only one you rostered was, was Derek Lively. I mean, but that, that's like a low end mid center, but it's like, you, you gotta be knocking down threes these days. We got even Tracy Jackson Davis is like, he seems a little bit more dynamic than what Clint Capella is today. So I, I just think the evolution of the center is bound to catch him. It's, it's, it's going to hit him hard, you know, and I, I just don't want to be holding that bag. And then as far as Keldon Johnson, I know a lot of us fantasy managers have kind of, um, the stock is down on him just based on where it was about two to three years ago. Uh, for, for me, I, I, I'm, I'm actually buying Keldon Johnson since everybody's kind of falling off on him be, just based on, I mean, he, he's sold. I mean, to me, I'm sold. Just how he's played the past two, three years. He's an NBA player. Wherever he's go, he, wherever he goes, he's going to be a big part of the rotation and, and a threat to average close to 18 points per game or so. So, um, I think a player like that, you just never know where they're going to land, even if Spurs don't don't commit to him as their core. I mean, you never know. They might trade him to Detroit, and he's over there averaging – he's someone that can average 22, 23 a game if he goes to Detroit. So um, someone like Keldon Johnson, I, I, I would hold on to. Um, yeah, I, I, I'll take the Keldon Johnson side. And also the Cam Reddish, just Cam Reddish on two-point mil. Like, he's taking, like, almost none of your cap. And if he gets in the game – that's a guy that, like, he does nothing, but he'll give you those steals that are kind of rare to find. So, yeah, give me Keldon Johnson and Cam Reddish. Because, so, correct me if I'm wrong, Case, but you're, you you like your Duke boys, right? Absolutely. that That's a factor, too. So, I'm yeah, still holding out yeah. to so Reddish. You still, yeah. believe, still have some belief in Reddish to do anything else, or he's kind of just like a steal specialist whenever he gets into the game pretty much nowadays? That's it. When the, when the roster is thin, he's going to get thrown in and get some steals. Okay. So that's going to take us to our next trade here. This is a three-team trade. Now, this doesn't seem to be like a very high-profile trade, but as I mentioned previously, the Angle Dynasty League is a real salary league. So when real player salaries are involved, it means that owners sometimes need to do moves that are similar to moves that happen in the real-life NBA. So an example that's provided by this trade here is a is what we refer to as a salary dump so mitch guide us through this what led to this salary dump and you know what's kind of the result of what happened with this salary dump too yeah so this trade was a result of a series of trades made by the once again featured brisbane bullets he made a trade with the bangkok tigers that we haven't covered um but that trade was josh giddy and bangkok's first for darius garland and because the Bangkok Tigers were already around hovering around the, under the cap, he was not able to afford Darius Garland and his max contract. So as a result, we had to facilitate and include a third team, uh, which is the Houston Commons, shout out Mark, to really execute that prior uh, Josh Giddy and Darius Garland trade. So what happened in this trade? Uh, Malcolm Brogdon's 22.5 mil got salary dumped to Brisbane Bullets in exchange for uh, Lonnie Walker from the Houston Comets. And Brisbane Bullets sent um, his 2026 second round pick to Lonnie Walker. So if you follow this diagram, it will really help illustrate the trade. Um, Brogdon was also shortly picked up after the salary dump by a tanking team known as the Magnolia Chicken Templados Hotshots, who has 
a large core of rookies from the 2024 class. So he could definitely afford to have someone like Brogdon, who still is a serviceable NBA level starter um, or a six man of the year candidate. So someone that should be rostered. But in terms of these circumstances where we are in a salary league and you're housing two or three max players, you know, sometimes you can't afford Malcolm Brogdon under your salary cap. And in a salary league, if you're above that cap, your, your roster itself will be deemed illegal and your stats won't contribute to your overall matchup for that week. So, Case, how do you feel about this move? You know, was, I guess, I want to trace it back a little bit in a sense where it's really Malcolm Brogdon, Josh Giddy, and his first for Darius Garland. I mean, tracing it back to trades, uh, two trades overall, does that make sense for the Bangkok Tigers since it's really a trade about him and for him dumping Malcolm Brogdon? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, whenever you're getting the best player out of the deal, like, um, that's always a, a good look, especially, um, in 30 teams where we tend to hold on dearly to those top end players. So yeah, it definitely makes sense. It, it does. Um, and, and you got something for Brogdon. So, um, it's not like, um, I know he was eventually dropped, and I think he even picked him up. But uh, I mean, as long as you got something for Brogdon, that that's a win for me. Like if 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 you if you're short on cap and then you you feel like you have to drop somebody, even though we're not close to the season, so you could kind of hold you have time to get a deal done. But but yeah, just um, these are all low level players. So whenever you can get a second for one of your low level players, that's that's a positive for me. And then even um, but if if you ask if you hold me to knife to as far as rank these assets. I would definitely, I, even though Brogdon is 22 mil, I mean, I would have him first because if you can fit him in your cap, he's useful, you know, especially um because he's he's in Washington right now, right? If I'm correct. Correct. He's projected to start actually. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Because I know a lot of us love Bub Carrington, what he could do, but that might be more of a second half thing or, I mean, you never know. He might have a good start, but Brogdon has the edge as far as experience and who could be the who they trust as a starting point guard. So I, 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 I rank Brogdon first. I'd probably take the second because if I know if I go on the block and say Lonnie Walker for a second, I probably won't get get many hits. So I take the <laughs> second round pick and then Lonnie Walker third. Yeah, Lonnie, something I forgot to mention about Lonnie Walker is that he doesn't have a guaranteed roster spot on the Boston Celtics. So, you know, just getting a second in exchange for Lonnie Walker is a pretty big win. Yeah, he, yeah, he's going to get waived probably. Yeah, I, I think I might consider, I mean... There's not really a true winner, but more so it was it was well known after the Garland trade that a third team needed to step in to help out in facilitating a salary dump. And Mark took advantage. He got a free second round pick for basically nothing. So that's just, you know, extra trade ammo for him. And one thing that should also be mentioned. So first off, we have Lonnie going to the Bangkok Tigers to give the Tigers a 10th guard basically on his team. Sorry, Weiss, <laughs> but you do need to get some forwards and you gave one away and Josh Giddy. I don't know why you did that, but you know, it's all good because you did get the highest ranked player dynasty wise in Darius Garland. So there is that. But Matt from Brogdon going to the Brisbane Bullets and then immediately being dropped means that there is a $22.5 million salary hole that opened up on the Brisbane Bullets. So that was the incentive for him to send a second round pick away is basically just creating a ton of cap space for himself. So obviously he did that in that move by sending Giddy away, who's still on his rookie deal. I'm sorry, by getting Giddy, who's still in his rookie deal, and sending away Darius Garland. And instead of, because a lot of times what happens in a salary league is you'll need to take on some bad money to facilitate a deal. So maybe he could have took on, you know, I mean, I'm not saying this is bad money, but he could have took on like Dorian Finney-Smith and his $14 million or something like that. But instead, he took on Malcolm Brogdon to fill out the $22.5 million and facilitate the deal and then dropped him because Brisbane figured I would rather have this cap space than actual Malcolm Brogdon himself. So even though he no longer has a second round pick and did not land Lonnie Rocker in this deal, there was no type of like actual physical asset that was sent to Brisbane. What he got in this deal was cap space. And so what people often have to think about with a salary league is like, you know, we only talk about trades in regards to players and picks. You know, we got these players and these picks, this players and these picks. But in salary leagues, you have the added factor of cap space. 
maybe you'll go through a deal or you'll see a deal happen where it looks like one side conceded a bit more value than the other, but you did, but you then come to see that that side also gained $10 million in cap space. So from that perspective, it evens it out a little bit more. So shout out to Brisbane as well for creating a large amount of cap space for himself. As we all know, this is his third trade that's featured within our last two episodes. This is a trade heavy guy. So giving him more cap space in addition to, like we talked about with the first trade, more picks to work with. It's a dangerous team. He's going to keep going. He now has built a core of Zion, Josh Giddy, um, and I'm blanking on the third. Giannis. One. Giannis. Yes. Thank you. Yes, mm-hmm. of course. Giannis. So that's incredible. You know, a team that is heavy in points, rebounds, and assists based off of those three guys in addition to a lot of a big supporting cast after that. Shout out to him for pulling that off. Absolutely. Okay, so that's going to take us to our fourth trade here. So this trade involves six six players, three players being exchanged on both sides. So this is another Aussie-based trade. We have the Hobart Chargers, Ben, once again featured. And then we also have the Singapore Slingers. Shout out to our friend Joy. Okay, so Singapore, he sent Bruce Brown, Mark Williams. This is our second time talking about a Mark, Tril- a Mark Williams trade in this league, by the way and Zach Collins. He sent those to Hobart in exchange for Onyeka Okongwu, who we were just talking about earlier, John Collins, and the new Clippers point guard, Chris Dunn. So this seems to be a, you know, a, a different kind of change of pace for both teams on both sides. The highest ranked player in this deal would certainly be Mark Williams. You know, but there, there's a bit more to look at on that side of the Onyeka, John Collins, and Chris Dunn side. So let's, you know, let's start us off with, uh, with Case. What do you feel about this move? I, I was. This would be way more difficult if we didn't get the news of Mark Williams being injured. Um, mm, I agree. Uh, yeah, that definitely because, like, you know, of course, Mark Mark Williams is a typical high ceiling, low floor gamble. You know, but this new this new injury is is devastating. It's not a devastating injury, but it's just is devastating due to the fact he's we've missed two seasons out of Mark Mark Williams because of this injury, and we're we're at a point where his rookie contract might just go to a waste, honestly. So uh, uh, there, there's a bit more bust risk associated with Mark Williams right now. Uh, when I, going on the OO side, I, I you know he OO just signed his his extension as well. So he's locked into a pretty friendly contract. I think he's making about fifteen mil a year now. So, mm-hmm. um, so yeah, he's locked into. So and he he always had some sneaky upside that I think people are starting to forget about. And we just we just discussed it in the not the last year but the trade before. As far as Capella, like um, we don't know where his cliff is, and we don't know um when OO is gonna come. But there's um, and Capella can get injured when he's injured. We saw what we, we seen what OO could do. So. I mean, uh, and then John Collins as well, I think is a sneaky asset there because he, he's a guy that had like a big name and a lot of people liked him, but a lot of people have kind of faded off because he didn't live up to potential, but he is still producing, especially over there in Utah where they need guys to produce. So um, give me the um, double O and John Collins side and Chris Dunn, you know, that's, it, it's, it sucks that Brax is in here to kind of hype up <laughs> the Chris Dunn side. I was going to bring Brax up too. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all good. But yeah, give me that trio of, of Double O, John Collins, Chris Dunn. Um, Bruce Brown, Zach Collins, they're cool. But it's just Mark Williams doesn't give me enough to um, reach the value of what Double O and John Collins gives you. I agree. And, you know, okay, so first off, we'll talk about one of, one of Braxton's favorite kinds of guards and just fantasy types of assets in general is these types of hyper-athletic point guards that he can pick up for cheap. Examples, Chris Dunn, Dennis Smith Jr. Braxton loves those kinds of guys. And I actually really like the role and landing spot for Dunn this year on the Clippers. The Clippers got quite a bit thinner. Even though they got rid of Paul George, they pretty much just added in like Derek Jones, uh, Kevin Porter Jr. and Mo Bamba in addition to Chris Dunn. So I think Chris Dunn's going to be a solid backup off the bench for them. John Collins, man, (sighs) He burned me that one year in redraft when he got suspended. It wasn't for performance enhancing drugs, but it was for basically agents that can potentially mask performance enhancing drugs. I think that's kind of was the turning point that really like stifled the momentum he had in his career. Because I would say I wasn't in Dynasty at that point when that happened. I would say that that was kind of a bit before 2020. Um, But I would probably assume he was like comfortably in like top 40, top 50 dynasty asset wise at that time. And then once the suspension happened, it kind of just went 
you know, faded away from there. Now he's in Utah. I know people talk about him potentially getting traded away from Utah, but I think there's just more question marks on the other side. In addition to Mark Williams being hurt, one of the most annoying things that happens in pretty much any sport is an athlete who waits till the very end of their offseason to get surgery. I have no idea why Bruce Brown didn't immediately get the surgery he needed once his offseason started. He instead now basically waited until like a week ago to all of a sudden say that he's getting surgery. So now we're potentially looking at the Raptors starting Grady Dick. So now not only is Hobart having to wait on Mark Williams, he also has to wait on Bruce Brown too. So the only active player that he's getting in this deal at this moment in time is Zach Collins, which is unfortunate uh, because obviously, you know, Mark Williams is the highest ranked player in this deal, uh, but there's just, you know, something going on with this guy physically wise, his back and his knees. There's just a lot of problems there. I really hope it pans out because Mark Williams is awesome as a dynasty asset. He's really fun to watch. I loved watching him when he was at Duke too. Mark Williams is a really good dynasty asset, but you know, just for overall stability and competitiveness, I would have to go with the two, with the, you know, current, current Hawk and former Hawk as well, a Kongwu and Collins. And yeah, some sneaky value from Chris Dunn there now that he's on a kind of a little bit of a depleted Clippers team. How do you feel about this one, Mitch? Uh, l- yeah, let me, add, let me add, so sorry. Let me add real quick the, that statement you said about Zach Collins being the only active player in that package. Like that's facts, but that's a crazy statement if you think about it. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it really goes to show how things can shift in the next month or so. And some point that... um Shout out Gerald Blazers. He brought up to me after I was complaining about all these injuries, like the Vince Williams one and the Mark Williams injuries, is that, you know, there is no obligation to report injuries in the offseason. And now that their media NBA media day has happened, you know, training camp has started, you know, teams are, you know, really required to report on these injuries for NBA clearance. So that's why we're seeing such an influx of these injury updates and it's very unfortunate for Hobart, who already has a very injury prone team, that all of you know these series of trades have resulted in you know injuries for him. Um, someone who does need that stability. And you know, to everyone's point, I want to say I lean towards that Anyeka, John Collins, and Chris Dunn side, just because really the best ability is availability. All right, so that's going to take us to our final trade of the episode here. So this is a good uh, a good time to have you on, Case, because this trade involves you. So first team involved in this trade is Benfica. Shout out to Bruno, our friend over in Portugal. Uh, Case, your franchise is known as the Las Vegas Aces. So during the startup of our league, we gave a lot of freedom with team names. Uh, people were allowed to name their team after any professional basketball club, male or female, any any country that they're in, they're allowed to name their team after that. So that's why you're seeing some crazy team names. As And then, you know, what a lot of people don't know is a lot of prominent soccer teams, such as Benfica for Bruno and Real Madrid, uh, which is what my team name is, also have basketball clubs too that are that have the exact same team name and logo. So that's why you're seeing, you know, what's typically associated as a soccer team logo in here. Um, and that's why you're seeing Case representing his hometown currently of Las Vegas. So in this deal, Benfica sent away Santi Aldama and Marcus Smart, two Grizzlies players, in exchange for Michael Porter Jr. So Case, you got off the Michael Porter Jr. trade in exchange for a bit more flexibility. So not only am I going to talk about Marcus Smart and Santi Aldama, but we're looking at, you know, maybe around $10 million of cap space that you got in that deal too. So, you know, I kind of go back and forth on Santi on if I'm a big believer or not. Mitch most definitely is. So I'm sure he's going to chime in on this. But what do you think about Santi Aldama? You know, of course, Marcus Small is a stalwart in regards to a nice steals and assists point guard. So let's just talk about Santi and you just your overall return in this deal for a prominent player in Michael Porter Jr. Yeah. So, um, yeah, this was this was a trade I've been looking for for probably a couple months because, you know, when, when I drafted my team, I did try to draft a win now team. A, a relatively youngish win now team, but um, when the salary started to settle in, I was above the cap by about two mil or so. So when I, when I analyzed my team, I realized Michael Porter Jr. is probably the guy I could move and save some cap space here. So, uh, uh, but yeah, shout out to Benfica because um, it, it was it was tough, it was harder to move him than I anticipated. Because, you know, um, just his salary at 35 mil and then it goes up to 40 mil over the f- next few years. 
a, a lot of people are aware of that. So uh, just his name value that you would think, Michael Porter Jr., it doesn't hold as much weight within our fantasy circles as you would think. So, um, so yeah, just moving off. This was just based on salary. I, I just wanted to get under the cap somehow and it, with a fair deal. So um, shout to Benfica for giving me something fair. I think this is fair. If you look at Marcus Smart and his production, uh, I think he's about 31 years old or some around that age. But it, with, with his production, um, what Brack said in, in, in the – in the podcast when he was analyzing the inaugural draft, I got a little insecure about my assists. So I was like, okay, maybe I should add some assists so those assists don't go away. So I'm um, adding Marcus Smart with those assists. And it's, it was really the steals, honestly, because if you look at my build, my build is more really of a, a big man build. And if you have a big man build, what you really need to um, dial in on is steals because they, they tend to lack steals. So if you get your guards with high steals, you have a pretty well-rounded team. So it's really about getting those steals and, um, and Santi Aldama, I think, is just a nice throw in just to even out the value because I'm I'm a believer in, in Santi Aldama. Just overall, I wasn't a big believer during the draft, but just based on seeing him play, similar, not not the same level as Keldon Johnson, but but in the same vein as far as he's an NBA player. So um, when the Memphis roster is thin, he's going to get some play and he's going to give me some production from the center spot, some center depth. And um, that that's why I made the move. And uh, honestly, um, with the draft pick of... Um, his name is slipping me. Um, Zach Eady. With the Zach Eady draft pick, I know a lot of people are, have kind of like tanked Santi Aldama's um, value, so I knew I could get him in as a cheap throw into this deal. So, yeah, um, overall, it's a fair deal. But, you know, since I'm involved and I got Marcus Small and Aldama, give me Marcus Small and Aldama. All right, very good. I mean, to your point, too, you know, steals being complimentary to big men. I think just the overall most complimentary type of player to if you have a big man heavy build. I know like your build is centered around Jared Allen. I think you have Shen Goon too, correct? Or correct. am I wrong about that? Yeah, correct. Correct. Yeah, Shen Goon, my boy, um, and Jared Allen. The most complimentary piece to big men is true point guards. So both assists and steals. And, and Marcus Smart absolutely represents that type of stat set. So I like I like this deal on both sides. I think I agree with your first point that it's a fair deal. Uh, because even if you think maybe there's not so much on the value side of Smart and Aldama, you still get 10 million cap space too. And of course, has to be noted that as of today, Jaron Jackson Jr. is currently hurt, uh, hamstring strain. I don't know. I think Memphis just needs to hire their entire uh, training room staff or, or fire all of their training room staff or something like that. I don't know why all these dudes get hurt so much. It reminds me of my favorite soccer club, Chelsea, the last couple of years. These just dudes are getting hurt left and right. So I'm not really, not really understanding why that's, ha- why that's going on. But um, there was even like some very mild speculation over this summer that Porter Jr. is going to get traded for some other pieces because the the Nuggets are kind of approaching cap space hell. They're not there yet, but they're approaching it. So, Mitch, now's your time to shine about your boy, Santi Aldama. How do you feel about this one? Dude, Case, I'm going to be completely honest. I love your side of the deal. You know, Santi Aldama, I believe, is very underrated. You know, we've seen what kind of damage he can do on Spain and the Olympics, he was pretty much their best player. So once heralded, you know, second place team, you know, over the last decade, uh, Santi Aldama, he's a great floor spacer, inconsistent free throw shooter, I have to admit, but he can provide a lot of spacing when let's say Jaron Jackson goes down, someone who's also very injury prone. And he's also a great ball handler. He's someone who can really grab and go, you know, facilitate, He's a little underrated there. And he provides some sneaky stocks. You know, he could be a potential, you know, two threes, one steal, one block kind of guy. And you're getting that for free on top of Marcus Smart. So something about Marcus Smart, I think he's getting a little bit underrated. He was someone who I was targeting in multiple leagues. You've seen this in big three. I targeted Marcus Smart. And he's someone that is going to be a pretty much a pillar in the Memphis Grizzlies defense. They're starting him at the small forward spot next to Desmond Bain and uh, John Moran, but he can also play that backup uh, point guard spot once John Moran gets his rest. I know they're going to probably stagger those minutes. So he's going to have a featured role regardless. You know, plus Vince Williams, Gigi Jackson, their small forward rotation is a mess. So expect heavy usage on Marcus Smart and who's really going to be a stalwart in those steals. Um, on the other side of things, Michael Porter Jr., someone who I just acquired from you, Andrew, um, is a lo- is a guy who really relies on his efficiency and his three-point volume. 
you know, if he's not scoring if, or if he's not getting rebounds, he provides some, you know, off position rebounds. He's not going to provide you any defensive stocks like a uh, Keegan Murray, another three and D prototypical guy. But unlike Keegan Murray, Michael Porter Jr. is on a max contract. So keeping all things account, you know, in case you're getting a wide range of stats with Santi Aldama and Marcus Smart. So I'm really loving the depth that you acquired here in this trade. Oh, yeah. Thank you, sir. I I'd like to also add to the, uh, as far as MPJ goes, like it is a little hard get giving him up just looking at the Nuggets roster and KCP's departure. Like some guys got to step up. So and, and Michael Porter Jr. does have um, the opportunity in front of him to have a big season. And I don't know if you guys remember, there was a window in like his first three years where he showed some upside, where he was giving like top 30 numbers with that high efficiency and high three points that um that Mitch is referring to. But uh, I, I just don't think, I think he's just learned in those first few years, he can't exert himself too much. So I, I don't think he's going to be the guy to really step in and fill in that hole that KCP kind of left. It's going to be one of those younger guys. So that's what, that's what made me comfortable with moving on from Michael Porter Jr. Man, before um, Michael Porter Jr. had all those back issues and in college watching his highlight tapes, he was the projected number one pick back in the day. And I was hyping him up like crazy. Remember, Andrew, we went to Vegas for my birthday. I was like, I'm putting 50 on uh, Missouri that year. They lost in the first <laughs> round. But I thought at one point in time that MPJ was going to be the light skinned Kevin Durant. Um, but it, you know, it, it doesn't look like he has that self creation. He's more of like a spot up shooter guy who's just gonna, you know, drain it, um, and play off the ball. But you know, that self creation never really came into fruition. But, um, you know, to your point, I, I do, I don't think Michael Porter Jr. has that usage, uh, because of his injury concerns. And, uh, so yeah, I, I just want to leave it at that. Yeah, I, 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 but I, I, I would add though, yeah, I think that is a personal decision. So, um, so, yeah, we don't know how he's feeling. If he's feeling good, I think he might surprise us there. But I do think that was a personal decision to not be a creator and just, you know, just shoot from the corner. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll attest to Mitch's excitement about Michael Porter Jr. We, I, I, I vividly recall a memory of where he and I were waiting in line of what I'll refer to as a California retail store. <laughs> and we actually met a guy who was from Missouri and visiting California at the time. And you and he went off into a huge tangent just talking about your excitement for Michael Porter Jr. and what he's going to bring to the NBA. So <laughs> I can absolutely attest to that for sure, that Mitch's, Mitch's bit was on Michael Porter Jr. pretty early. So, yeah, it's, you know, a, a good trade to talk about in general, especially because Porter Jr. was somebody that you and I just exchanged today, Mitch. So um, we can share that deal right now. So Mitch and I, uh, we make a lot of trades, but we don't usually make super high profile trades. We usually make like smaller trades, but today was a high profile one. So I sent Mitch, my my Michael Porter Jr. and Max Struess for Rudy Gobert and Jordan Hawkins. So leave a comment down below who you think, you know, what side you'd rather go with. This is the only league that I'm in where I am currently trying to rebuild. My team kind of ended up in like, you know, I was a 14th seed or something like that the first year. Last year, I think it was like 10 or 11. And I would only make it to the second round, get my money back, and then it'll be eliminated. So I wanted to try to play a little capture the flag this year because I am very excited about Cooper Flag. And, you know, as part of the rebuild process was trying to narrow things down as much as I could. Um, so that, that, was a, that was a fun trade today. That's a good one for, for us to talk about as well, too. Okay, so that's going to do it for us on our five trades that we are talking about today. So again, we will probably revisit the Angle Dynasty League maybe around like November or so after a couple of months have played out, after we see, you know, who the top dogs are, who's going to probably start looking towards a rebuild. So we'll visit some more trades that have happened during that, that time too. You can expect us three to appear again on um, one of the next videos we're going to do covering the Angle Dynasty League, which is covering the power rankings for that league. So we're kind of like a, you know, a preseason preview to how that league we think is going to play out. We're going to talk about where each team is currently looking outlook wise for all 30 of the teams that are involved in this league. So I'm excited to get on that with both of you guys. Uh, once we start talking about that, that'll probably happen really close to when the season is going to begin. Cause I know Mitch, you and I are probably going to pump out a few mock draft videos and a couple of things in between there too. So excited to get back together with this group here to discuss that too. So case, thank you so much for coming on today. 
Uh, I'm very excited moving forward for you to be a regular guest on here just because, you know, I, I, I don't want that great voice of yours to go to waste. The, the, the Case Cord podcast was one of my most favorite things that you did. So we need to have you back on here doing some Dynasty Basketball podcasts. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, thank you, Andrew. That means a lot, man. I appreciate you. And I definitely look forward to coming on again and again and showing your support, man. And also, too, Mitch, you better be coming with me to Vegas next year, because if you guys haven't seen it, the vlog that I did um, for covering my experience at Las Vegas Summer League, you'll see lots of glimpses of Case in that pod, too. That was my that was my tour guide. That's my local Las Vegas resident is Case. So he was taking me everywhere, showing all the best places that are out there. I mean, I've been to Vegas before, but being there with a resident of Vegas is a whole different experience, too, in addition to just having a great person to talk hoops with the entire time, too. So, Mitch. You better commit. You're coming to Vegas with me next year. Yeah, this might be the year. You know, my international trip is in May uh, in 2025. So I, I really have no excuses for uh, next year. So looking forward to, you know, seeing all three of you, watching some hoops and watching Cooper flag really erupt and win summer league. Oh, that's going to be big. I mean, not just flag. We got Bailey. We got Harper. DJ uh, Edgecombe's going to be in that summer league too. That's going to be an insane summer league. A lot, probably a lot better than the last one that we went to. So lots of things to look forward to with this group here. But thank you again, everybody, for tuning in today. Um, if you are interested in learning more about this league and what we do, be sure to join our Discord channel. We were going to leave in the link in the description for that below. And also comment below. Let us know who you thought was a winner for each of these trades here. Uh, we would love to hear from you. Love to get some feedback on how we're doing with the podcast as well. So make sure to subscribe if you are new to the channel. And we'll catch you guys next time. Captain, always gotta look for him. Beat so tight, I almost put a hook on it. First so far, I almost put a cook on it. Had a shit jumping, looking like I put a foot on it. Got a hundred on a dash when I book Sonic. Only game that I play, got a book on it. Got a flow so hard that it looks solid. Y'all be cynical.